Hey, my name is John Weirs. I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I am the NAWI Water Dams Data Manager. I'm here today to talk to you about water dams and cover data management and submission training. The purpose of this training is to help with actually submitting data to the Water Dams Data Repository, and it's been tailored for road mapping and uh, cartography efforts within the NAWI program. And so our goal is to make sure that Everyone in that program has all the information they need to put together a good data submission package, get it up on water dams, and, uh, and has a clear idea of what to submit and how to submit. I'm going to start with a little background information on Nawe IDA, water dams, and some of the other platforms that we're using for data management. But we're going to breeze through that real quick so that we can really spend all our time on data management and submission training. And uh, please stay tuned. There will be a live demo after the PowerPoint. So we're going to walk through data submission uh, and actually submit some stuff to a water dam site. And uh, we'll show off some of the intelligent form fields, auto detection of data types, navigation, and, and other features. So first, the quick introduction to water dams. There are two separate but integrated tools behind the scenes, uh, Data Foundry, which is our secure collaborative sandbox. Hopefully you all have access to the Data Foundry by now and have used it in one regard or another. If you don't, you can email me afterwards and I'll happily get you set up with access to the right projects and folders in there. This particular training is going to be focused on Nawe Water Dams, the public facing catalog listed there in the second. That's where all the data from the baselining and road mapping efforts is going to be stored there's already some data there. Um, that's the public information dissemination portal. So Data Foundry is our secure sandbox where we can play around, work with stuff, um, refine it, delete things, add things. And once we get things more or less ready for public consumption, then we can uh, put them into Nawe water dams. Right now that process is manual, but one of the first things we'll be developing in the next quarter, in the beginning of 2021, will be an automated connection between the two, so you'll actually be able to just click a button from Data Foundry to send stuff to water dams. Here's another way, uh, another view of that picture where you can see that secure collaboration space lets, uh, lets us all sort of work together on data, and then when we want to push things out into the public domain, that's where the Nawe Water Dams data repository comes from. Um, if you've used either by now, you're probably familiar with the fact that they both live on OpenEI, that's just because we're leveraging some proven technology and building upon an existing platform that has over a decade of energy information domain expertise and um, user authentication and all kinds of uh, security protocols in place so we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. So we've built water dams and Data Foundry on top of OpenEI. And uh, I'm going to skip through the Data Foundry since we've already talked about that a little bit. Here's a little screenshot of it. Um, it's really the place for us to work and share files seamlessly with one another while conforming to DOE cybersecurity rules and all those other things. Um, just overcomes a few hurdles and that not every institution has access to Dropbox or Box or Google Drive. And some of our institutional rules are mutually exclusive. And so this just gives us to collaborate where we know we're um, all playing on a level playing field. And, uh, and it's also been designed from the ground up to support collaboration. So it's removing some of those issues with collaboration like independent views and things that some of the other data management tools out there have that can actually be troublesome. So on to water dams, what we're really here for. Water dams, as I mentioned, is our public data dissemination portal. It's centralized access to public data sets. That's where we're going to publish our key NAWI data and models and get them out there to the world. Um, it's where we're going to disseminate our data to the greater scientific community, and I'll talk a little bit about how it does that here in a moment. Um, but it's also where we already have some data. So you can go to waterdams.nawahub.org slash submission slash all, or just go to the main page and you'll find access to the data very easily. And we already have some curated water relevant data from a few pre-selected sources. We're obviously going to be putting all of our cartographers data into water dams here this month. And uh, and this is our training, this, this beginning of December training. So we're just getting started populating the data in water dams. There's a lot more data to come, um, and this is just the beginning. 
So I mentioned that it's a dissemination platform and that's really where its true value is. So water dams in its current form has been built from the ground up to disseminate information. Um, it's, a, it's a bare bones data submission and uh, aggregation repository. It has its own search capabilities and lets people put data in there of any type and helps organize it and package it up into universal metadata schemas. Don't know what all that means, don't worry about it. Um, I'm going to tell you that essentially what it means is behind the scenes, everything we submit to water dams is being automatically broadcast to network of data sharing partners that includes on one side, the DOE Data Explorer and OSTI, the DOE Office of Science and Technical Information. We're assigning DOI numbers. We're generating Thompson Reuters press releases for each data set that gets published through water dams. And we're also funneling information up to the Greater OpenAI platform, to data.gov, to Google Dataset Search, even to Google Scholar. You'll see in the demo that we put a lot of emphasis on making sure that data sets are properly cited. and We have the proper metadata associated with them so that they can feed into all these different network partner sites. And the reason is it's all about information dissemination, getting the word out there. Um, we have uh, metrics from similar tools where we can say that, you know, for each user that comes to water dams to, to find a particular data set, tens if not hundreds of users are finding those same data sets through Google searches, through data.gov, through these other established platforms that have, um, that already have millions of users. So there's a huge scientific audience we can reach by being connected to this network, and that's exactly why we're connected to it. But what's important for you to know as a submitter or a potential data submitter is that when you are submitting data to the water dams platform, you really are submitting it to the greater scientific community. So this is not just uh, handing in deliverable to your supervisor on the Nawe project team or reporting to your colleagues that are familiar with your work. This is more akin to publishing in a journal or broadcasting your information to a whole community of people. And that will become important when we actually start putting together our submissions. So we want to make sure when we're titling it, when we're coming up with the abstract for that data submission, that we're using universal language and we're spelling out acronyms and that we're not including what I would call like any internal project speak. Because we want to make sure that these data are uh, as useful as possible to the greater community so they have the greatest utility and, uh, and go forth and help uh, advance the state of science in water innovation. So that's what water innovation is all about, right? So what types of data are we looking for? Um, we're, we're looking for any data that we're generating really with funding from uh, the DOE AMO, um, any data we're generating through this Nawe research effort, not just traditional data sets in terms of spreadsheets and CSVs, um, but uh, also streaming data, instrument data coming off in, you know, SegWi or other uh, technically specific formats, um, but also maps, charts, photos, logs, even PowerPoint presentations. We're using a very loose definition of data here. And Nawe Water Dam's platform is capable of handling any type of data that you want to submit to it. We're also looking for raw data in many ways. Um, I know we're doing a lot of researching efforts and, and, and initially with these baselining, you know, it's a lot of categorization, but eventually we're gonna be doing um, actual R&D projects and pulling in various analyses and models and simulations. And, and especially when we start utilizing the TAP3 tool, we want both the raw data, the input data, as well as the output data. And the reason we want that is that there's a, an, an intrinsic value to raw data. Raw data is free to, be used again and again. You know, summary data or data that's gone through any transform or analysis process is by its very nature biased towards the goals of that analysis. That's in a good way and a good thing. But the raw data remains free to be used again in a similar way, but also in a completely different way. So that it's, uh, it's actually been shown to prove innovation because that freedom, that flexibility allows it to be used in unforeseen ways, which is great. Um, that being said, there is such a thing as too raw. Um, we don't want just a string of bytes coming right out of the device, for example. We want to make sure that there's enough metadata or that the data is finished enough that it's comprehensible, usable, and useful. 
so this little example graphic here, um, we have uh, uh, just a fake little data stream that I made up. And uh, on the left, you could see what would, in a sense, be raw data output from a single sensor. And it's recording time and it's recording uh, what we don't know. There's no Y axis label. And in fact, there's no X axis label. We could assume that it's time in seconds based off that particular device that that's being sensed. But um, but even if we knew that it was time in seconds, there's no context, there's no relevant time. So we're, we can infer the units, but you, you can understand from this silly little example how quickly assumptions get made and, and how potentially um, troublesome those assumptions can be as end users are downloading this data set and using it again and again and again and building their research off of those assumptions, et cetera. So there's a couple of simple things we can do to make this a lot more useful and a lot more usable. Um, we can add a precise time uh, that makes it easier to contextualize. Even if the data stream itself is in seconds from uh, the start, we don't know if that's when the machine was turned on or the start of the day or what. So just categorizing that one little piece and including things like the time zone um, and the exact location allow us to actually better contextualize the information. And then what we can do is we can associate it with other data streams. So if I know that this particular data stream occurred on March 10th, 2013, at exactly this time and exactly this time zone, um, I could potentially correlate it to other events that happened that day. Maybe there was an earthquake and that caused some numbers to fluctuate a little bit. Maybe there was some other event in a in a water production facility that, uh, that I'm trying to correlate and see that event's influence over this data stream. So that's just uh, another, like I said, very basic example, but hopefully you get the idea of why it's so important to have that proper metadata to capture that information so that we can create those contextualizations and create those comparisons. Um, what types of data do we not want on Nawe water dams? Uh, we don't want any personally identifiable information, no social security numbers or bank account numbers, um, no home phone or personal addresses. There's always a little bit of confusion when it comes to contact info. Somebody's publicly available contact info is okay. Um, not only is it okay, but we do actually require a point of contact for each data set in case the users of the data have questions about that data. So um, contact information, public information is fine. Somebody's business email address, that's fine, but no personal information or personally identifiable information. We also don't want any business sensitive information. Um, all information that goes to Nawi Water Dams should be suitable for eventual public release. And I say eventual because it doesn't have to be immediately publicly releasable. What Water Dams does have is the ability to put a data set in under a moratorium and select a future research date. Uh, this probably won't apply to many, but those of you that are collaborating with industry on something proprietary or the invention of new technology, uh, if you're using Department of Energy funds, those accolades are subject to eventual public release, but may also be subject to a CRADA, a Collaborative Research and Development Agreement for a time being. Um, what happens is you can actually submit those data right now to Nawi Water Dams, but you check the moratorium box, and I'll demonstrate this later, and you, you pick the release date at the end of the CRADA, and those data will be in the system, the metadata will be in the system available for searching right now, but the data themselves won't be downloadable until that specified future release date. So that, uh, that end date in the CRADA will automatically trigger in uh, an eventual public release when the system gets to that point. Until then, like I said, the metadata are available in the system and searchable, and there's a really important reason for that. There's an intrinsic value in knowing that data exists, even if they're not available to the public yet. So public researchers and other data scientists and people interested in this information in the public can find it through Google Scholar, through these searches, like I said, can find the metadata about the data and see that, hey, these data actually do exist, even though I can't have access to them yet. But they can see a description and they can see the contact information and that empowers them to either call up the person and ask for an advanced copy of the data if they needed it, or better yet, 
call up a person and say, hey, we were thinking about doing the same thing. Let's collaborate. Let's work together on the next phase of this project, as opposed to not having any information about those data, not knowing those data exist, and then being in a position where they're honestly quite likely to reinvent the wheel. So we want to try and avoid that. We also don't want any duplicate data. So the, another thing that Nawe Water Dams allows us to do is link instead of upload duplicate data. So if a data set already exists online somewhere, uh, a relatively permanent home on the internet, we can just provide a link to that data and just uh, um, associate things that way. And a great example of that, which I'll show during the demo, is a GitHub repository. You know, um, uh, code repositories are are do a fantastic job at making a permanent home on the web for code. We don't need to replicate that. We'll just leverage it and link to it. One of the other things I'll be demonstrating is uh, the ability to define a location. So we're going to have custom uh, area selector in there where you can actually like pick a particular region, zoom in on it, and uh, and identify geospatial bounds for your data set. For any specific data sets that were generated from an individual facility or piece of coastline, for example, we want to define that location because it helps make those data much more discoverable. Um, optionally, at the top, you can switch to the point tab and identify a single point if you want. Um, but really, a point is a tiny square. So uh, if you can make a bounding box or a square using the map tool, we highly recommend that. Ultimately, we require locations for everything, even abstract concepts, like I said, are un universally applicable data uh, are assigned a location of Earth. Um, it might sound silly, but having a location for everything increases the search results and increases the relevance of data and some of those uh, network of data sharing sites that I mentioned, especially when somebody's doing a geospatial search. Uh, and the reason is, if I, for example, am looking for data in Colorado, and I'm on one of those sites and I draw a box around Colorado, uh, those, site, those tools are smart enough to say, oh, this data set's relevant to the entire world, therefore it's relevant to Colorado. And that provides the critical metadata to increase the relevancy of that data set in those search results. Whereas if I don't supply that information, then the machines on the other side of these search algorithms don't necessarily know whether or not the data is relevant, and it just shows up lower in the results. So um, at the end of the day, it's just all about feeding the beast to make sure that we have all the metadata information out there to make our data discoverable. We also want to make sure we have all the data metadata out there to make our data useful. And, uh, and that's why we're looking to provide metadata to our data, because really information is data with context. And the metadata that we'll be supplying is contextual information about those data. It's really helping us to use those data properly. The attribution of metadata um, is essentially necessary to communicate effectively. I, I mentioned it provides context and discovery, but it also aids in understanding. And so when we go and put these data sets together and we're adding the description of these fields, it's important to keep that understanding component in mind as well. Um, you might have labeled your data T equals 38 and know exactly what that means. Maybe everyone on your project knows what that means, while uh, people outside of your sphere of influence may have to guess, you know, is that time, is it temperature, what units is it in, what, what time interval is it in, what, what are we associating this T with. Um, it sounds like, again, a really silly example, um, but we see a lot of data sets that come through and it's often these uh, overlooked assumptions that can create problems down the road, especially when somebody comes in and guesses wrong at what they thought you meant and then builds upon that for the next uh, layer of research. So uh, metadata is important. Um, take your time on it. If you have questions, we have curators and other water dam staff that are able to help you out and answer any questions. So we have a pretty rigorous data provenance strategy in water dams. We really are trying to create a scientific record with these data submissions as we're publishing them to the scientific community. And so our data provenance strategy involves an update philosophy. And what I want to help you realize in planning your data submissions and planning your data projects 
is that it's important to plan for multiple iterations. Um, we suggest storing data by vintage and version so that if you come across this question, you have a good strategy on how to address it. You know, this is uh, another interesting example question where you, you found a mistake in your 2010 data and you want to fix it, but you've already published it. What do you do next? Well, you know, is it 2010 version two or is it 2020? Because it's the 2020 update of the 2010 data. You can see that it can get sort of confusing fairly quickly. And so using long verbose names that really help make this very clear is another easy way to add metadata to your data sets whether those are file names or column headers um, we live in the age of of large hard drives and fast internet connections so there's no reasons to save bytes um, go ahead and, and spell it out if you can and uh, and that's um, the general data provenance strategy that we're we're suggesting to all the teams out there doing work. And then when it comes to water dams itself, our data provenance strategy is that, uh, and I'll show you some of this during the demo, but when you submit data, um, it will go through a curation process where a curator will review it for metadata quality, completeness, and accuracy. And we'll not be reviewing the data itself because we're not here to pass judgment on individual findings or research outcomes or anything like that. We'll just be looking at metadata quality to make sure that you've accurately described what you've submitted uh, and that it's understandable by somebody outside your project, that you didn't leave out anything you referenced um, and that you didn't accidentally supply anything you shouldn't have supplied. So um, that's uh, looking for quality, completeness and accuracy of the metadata. And then once things are curated in water dams, it goes into that publication cycle uh, where it'll either stay in that time release vault until that moratorium date arrives, or in the case of most of the submissions, we'll just immediately begin becoming publicly accessible and propagating through that network of data sharing partners. Once it's pushed out to all those sites, it's more or less set in stone. And so our data provenance strategy then is to assume that people are already citing it and using it and referencing it and we don't want to invalidate any of their references so once something's public uh, and has gone through the whole publication process on water dams if you have changes that you need to make to that data set we can always add stuff to it but we probably won't be able to remove anything from it um, our data provenance strategy really relies on the mechanism of adding additional versions to things so we can create updated or corrected versions of various data files but we always want to preserve those originals so that we have any back references uh, supported for anyone who's already referenced or done future work uh, based off your data submission now if you just submitted it like two seconds ago and realized a mistake we can probably work with you on that uh, so feel free to contact us and um, as you'll see during the demo at any time you can click uh, email water dams help at the bottom of the screen and send us an email and we can help you out with your data questions provenance or otherwise so a lot of thoughts gone into this structure and plan and at the end of the day um, all of these policies that we have on data submission and management are really about protecting DOE's investment in research and development activities and making sure that the outcome of all the hard work we're doing at Nawe is there to stay and around for a long time and is as usable, discoverable, uh, and useful as possible to the greater scientific community. So that's the end of the uh, PowerPoint portion. I'll go into a live demo here in a second. Uh, before I do, I thought I'd just show you a quick timeline on what's going on in water dams. So we're doing our submission training right now. We'll be officially launching water dams this month, and it's going to be populated with all the data from the baselining and road mapping activities as the cartographer's data starts coming in. And then coming up next quarter um, in January 2021, we'll be working on that integration with the data foundry I talked about. And we'll also be incorporating feedback from cartographers and others, uh, including feedback from the Water Dams Energy i -Corps team that Jay and Quay have done a tremendous job at leading and, uh, and bringing in suggested improvements and usability tweaks to Water Dams. And so there'll be uh, continual updates to the platform. And the reason I want to stress that is that 
Um, even though we have, we're doing the official launch and, and everything's up and running right now, um, it's not set in stone. Um, it's a living, living, breathing tool designed for you and the Nawi community. And we want to make it as useful as possible. So um, that's why we're constantly refining things. And as you'll see during the demo, um, we're, we're making the form, the submission form even smarter. We're incorporating auto detection of various data types. And we have functionality improvements uh, that allow you to, you know, save at any time, submit when you're finished, et cetera, so that you don't have to do it all at once. And trying to make submission as easy as and painless as possible while still capturing that rich metadata. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, before I jump into the live demo, I thought I'd stop for a quick moment and see if there's any questions. Will there be any information to viewers how to cite specific language data publications presentations provided through the water dam system? Yes, absolutely. Um, since I'm sharing my screen and I'm a visual person, let's go ahead and take a look. I'm at waterdams.nawi.hub.org. And uh, I'm just gonna pop into, um, you can view all the submissions through that menu. You can also search for stuff here. I'm just gonna take a quick pop over to our search interface and pick a uh, submission at random. And this is the screen that you see when you're viewing a submission, uh, whether you're logged in or not. Um, you can see the status, authors, uh, you can download individual resources or all of them. This includes a link, so there's a, a way to view that to view a link. And under the share category, we have uh, the, um, I believe this is properly MLA formatted citation. You can copy the citation into the clipboard with a single click. You can also export that citation in RAS format for inclusion in, uh, uh, I think it's like three out of the four top citation tracking tools. Not everyone uses RAS, but, um, but that gets us most of them. So good question. At what level are the data are protected by copyrights? This is a big question and I'm really glad you asked it. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but basically we're, we're making these data publicly accessible. And our default license is, is clearly stated for all data sets as CC attribution. So um, anyone's free to use and reuse the data as long as they attribute the original authors and the original organization which are displayed right on the screen and included in that original citation. And in terms of copyright, and the because the NAWE program is using federal funds in the US, uh, federal government reserves a special copyright exemption that covers all US um, federally funded research and development and, and is um, uh, a matter of US copyright law. So, if you're worried about submitting something to water dams that you've already submitted to a journal or a paper or anything that has its own copyright, um, it's okay to submit it to water dams because of the federal copyright exemption. Uh, you could submit it to both places. You could also avoid the issue by using the link feature to link directly to that, that article or paper wherever it's hosted online. Um, but if it's behind a paywall or if it's otherwise inaccessible, like for members only or something, then you may actually want to consider uploading a copy of it to water dams. Um, and we are allowed to do so with one exception, because everything I just said is a matter of US copyright law, it only applies to publications published in the United States. And since everything's virtual these days, it gets a little tricky. But if your conference or your journal or your publication is housed in another country or anywhere outside the US, we do not have an international copyright exemption. And you should, in those cases, only link to the hosted publication on the third party website. Um, that exemption only applies to the US. It's very tricky, like I said, if you have questions about that, that's a great opportunity to use that help feature and, um, and just contact Water Dam's help which opens an email to our team or even under here and help contact water dams help. And we'd be happy to help you sort that out. Um, well, that's, that's copyrights in a nutshell. All right. Any other questions before I move on? Nope. Okay. Let's get into submissions. 
So this is the Nawe home, and you can see um, I don't have any submissions. And if I wasn't logged in, I would see a big button telling me that I need to be logged in in order to submit data. But now that I am logged in, I have a big submit button there or the opportunity to view any submissions I'm in the middle of working on. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I can also get to those options under the data menu. So I'm going to go ahead and submit data. And this is our submission form and a few high level things. There's navigation on the left that lets me jump to various sections. There's that moratorium I was talking about. Um, at the bottom, you can see an opportunity to save or submit, and we'll get those in a second. And I'm going to start off with uh, my submission name. And so the first thing I want to emphasize that I mentioned during the PowerPoint is that, again, we want to think about this uh, in terms of communicating to that greater scientific community. So the what I absolutely do not want to do is put something that's using all internal speak in here, like Dewey deliverable task 3.4 um, report. That's like literally meaningless to anyone outside of our project. And honestly, like most of the people in our project don't know your individual task numbers and would have a hard time figuring out what that's about. What I want to do is communicate very clearly, just like I would a journal paper title uh, or article, uh, what exactly I'm going to be discussing. So we'll say analysis and outputs from testing of the Pratty 5 water flow device. And again, I'm making this up. So nothing in here is real. Um, just an example. The description, um, this should be a typical abstract. Um, getting a little meta here, but like uh, it should describe the contents of the data set. I say data set because, as you'll see in a moment, uh, where you can have as many number, as many different files as you want in this submission. So you can have any number of files of any size, and you can organize them together. And uh, we definitely rely on you all to help self-organize these into various submissions. You can also have as many submissions as you want, um, with the idea is that each submission would be a bucket of relevant information, what we call a complete submission package. Uh, a good example of that would be, you know, and as you'll see here, like if you had um, a modeling tool and you submitted the code for the model, the input data, the output data, and maybe like an image of, of some of the charts and figures that it produced, you get that complete package all in one. And so anyone who's using the model has like everything they need right there at their fingertips to use that model properly. So this description would uh, describe all of that. So it would be, you know, this for my example, I'll say um, um, uh, another way to think about this is that the submission contains dot, dot, dot blank, and you're putting that in there. So this will be data from the first two days of the Pratty 5 test and a link to the Pratty 5 analysis code base. The other thing this metadata field is for in the description is this is your opportunity to caveat anything that's important or critical to the understanding of a tool. Um, you know, data was developed using the we'll say Acme testing tank um, null values from the second day of testing were due to a temporary outage not actual zeros very important to capture any of that insider knowledge um, that's relevant to the actual experience of the project itself stuff that you think uh, your team absolutely knows, other people aren't going to know, but even stuff that you are keenly aware of today, you might not be as keenly aware of 10 years from now when you're looking back on this. So this is a great opportunity to track and capture all that stuff. The next field is keywords. It's very easy. Um, just you can put in whatever keywords you want here. Say this is a tank test. Um, We'll say this was, I'll put the name of the device, 
ID5, and we'll say this was flow, flow test. If I've already put one in, it mounts it. If I don't like one of them, I can use the cursor to erase it. I can also use the keyboard, it's building in lots of options to the interface, just trying to make it as easy as possible. And then we have our five main areas for Nawe, agriculture, industrial, municipal power and research extraction. I'll say this was related to municipal water. And uh, you can select more than one if something's uh, multidisciplinary. Um, this is just to help feed into search later on so that people can find stuff. Same with the keywords. Um, these just go out to Google, to other search engines to help make the data more discoverable. If you're not quite sure what to put in there, just do your best. And it's one of the main things that our curators look at when they come back through, they'll go in there and clean those up for you. All right, that's gonna know my info as the contact because I'm logged in, that's just for convenience. But if I wanted to put somebody else's info in here, I can very easily just come up here and do that and say, Jay Huggins is actually the con point of contact on this, but I'll leave it as me for now. And so the origination date, this is the date that the data was actually developed or originated. Um, we'll say it was from December 1st this year. And uh, if it was developed over several days, uh, you can put the earliest date as a good rule of thumb. And that will um, let people know when the data is from. Uh, put in quite a bit of stuff. I don't wanna lose my place. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. And it's gonna save my submission so far. And just to show you what that looks like, if I popped out of here and went back to the home page, let's say I needed to go eat lunch, or even more likely, let's say I needed to go consult somebody on the metadata or find a missing file for my submission, we recognize that that takes time and energy to do. So we set it up so you can always walk away and come back to it later. And so you can see here, my example demo submission is now listed under my submissions, and we can see a little snippet of that timeline. Let me zoom in on that for you all. Um, you can see it's in progress right now, uh, has not been submitted. Once it's submitted, it'll be in a queue awaiting curation, go through the curation process until it's awaiting release and then becomes publicly accessible. So that's kind of the life cycle of a submission on Nawe water dams. And once it's public, then it's out there free for everyone to use. So let me unzoom. to pop back into my submission and pick up where I left off. You can save as many times as you want uh, while you're filling it out. And, uh, and also don't worry about hitting submit. We've organized the system so that if you do hit submit and it's not a complete submission, it will just tell you what to do next, focusing on things one field at a time. So actually when in doubt, uh, if you're not sure what to do next, you can just hit submit and it'll tell you, oh, I need to add an author. Uh, author is a required field for OSTI and some of our other data integration partners. So we insist on uh, data authors. This is actually pretty cool. Uh, it's something relatively new to the information science space, tracking authorship and citations for data objects. And it's something that um, Google Scholar is picking up and, and other um, tools out there in the field. So if you are an author and you have an ORCID ID, you can put it in here. Um, I'm listing myself as an author, but I can have as many authors as I want. I'll add J um, and it also adds their organizations too. So I can have um, 20 authors in here if I need to. And then that way, um, all the people that helped work on the analysis and the data sets and the data visualizations can get credit too, not just the, uh, the people that ended up in the final publication. So that's pretty exciting. And all of this metadata travels out um, to all those data sharing partners as well and, and shows up in um, you know, H indexes and other uh, citation tracking uh, sources, et cetera. So um, we, uh, we already have a few NAWE data sets that have been cited and whose authors have been given credit. So that's pretty exciting. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and save again, because why not? Um, this is that moratorium field I was talking about. And if you were to place your submission under moratorium, you just check this box and enter the date you previously agreed upon, whatever's in that crater between you and DOE and the third parties um, for the eventual release. 
you see it's got a year selector and it defaults between now and five years out since that's the longest term limit for uh, a DOE CRADA. Um, if you have any questions on this, feel free to contact us and we can help you sort it out. Um, it should be uh, a fairly unlikely scenario. Most of our data sets, I think, will be ready to go right to the public. But um, if you do select a date in the future um, and save that, then in this particular example, these wouldn't be released until the 15th of December 2021, um, regardless of when they're done being curated. I'm going to uncheck that box for now and, uh, and go ahead and hit save again, and then I'm going to hit submit. And it's telling me that I have to have data in my data submission. Imagine that. Uh, so I have the opportunity here to add files or links as I discussed previously. I'll show you how the files works. I've got some test data in here. And uh, we'll go ahead and say we're going to grab a summary document and two data sets. And I can just use my keyboard with shift or control to select multiple files. You don't have to do them one at a time. Um, I can open up, in this case, three at once. Uh, it's going to upload them in, and um, again, uh, no limits on file size or numbers of number of files. Uh, Nawe Water Dams exists in the Amazon cloud and uses an infinitely scalable drive, which is really cool. So it can literally handle anything you throw at it um, within reason. I guess if you exceed all of Amazon's bandwidth, that would be amazing. But um, good luck trying. The um, Next thing you'll notice is that now that I have some data sets in there, I need to supply a, an additional metadata field or two for each. So the system's done its best to try and figure out what you submitted. So it's automatically recognized that the Excel files were data. And if I open them up, um, I've got the title in there and data, and it's even actually identified the date of that data set out of the title and pre-populated it for me. So all I have to do is come in here and say, this is data from day one of the flow test experiment. And the reason I'm supplying additional metadata for these, and you can see as I finish them change, is that um, it's data from day two of the experiment. Uh, when people view this data set, especially when it has a bunch of different files, this is the only way they can differentiate between the different files and figure out which one they want to download. Um, in some cases, that will be much more relevant than others, uh, but it is a required field for a bunch of our data sharing partners. So we ask that you supply additional metadata per file. It's actually very useful to put in per file caveats. So, you know, this one, as we mentioned in the previous, um, null value issues on, uh, we'll say, rows 13 through 42 are the results of a device that was accidentally powered down and not actual zeros. Making all this stuff up, but uh, you get the idea. Um, Another thing that might be important to put in here would be, you know, if it's a software package or if it's like a MATLAB file, you know, what what um, other packages or dependencies are required in order to use this file? Um, or other things need to be downloaded and installed before you can use it? Are there Python libraries that it requires, et cetera? Um, useful metadata goes in there. And then I need locations uh, for each of these two, but we'll do that in a second. Um, this Pratty 5 summary document it has detected as an image because it's a JPEG. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily an image. And so it's got more options in here for us because the system's smart enough to realize that, you know what, it might be a chart, um, but it might be a scanned document. And in that case, let's say the scanned copy of the summary document. Um, obviously, it'd be better to include a Word doc or text or something a little more machine readable than a scanned copy of a document. We always want to include the highest value, best value version of our data. But for this particular example, we'll say that's all I have. Um, and the document um, illustrates the test configuration and outlines the testing parameters. All right, and let's say we wrote that document back in September. We can give individual dates and descriptions for each of these. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and save. I want to demonstrate the link ability really quick. 
So I'm going to go grab a link to uh, a code base that I just happen to know I have in my browser history. I'm going to plug this in. Okay, so this is a code that's hosted on GitHub. And as if I paste this in, you can see the system's automatically detected that it's a GitHub link. And so I'm going to add this, and, uh, and it's automatically detected that it's code and, uh, and generated a link as an additional resource in this data set. When I go to add the additional info here, it actually happened really fast, so you may have missed it, but it jumped out to GitHub and fetched all the relevant info in. So it knows the programming language. It grabbed the description from the GitHub project meta, and it put the uh, date from the earliest commit from that particular GitHub project right in there for me. Um, I can change any of this stuff if I want to, but uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and say done. That one's easy. All right, location. So we mentioned that location is pretty abstract. I'm gonna show you how this works. If I wanted to uh, say like, let's say hypothetically, this is from somewhere in California, off the coast of San Francisco, I could move this over and adjust my bounding box appropriately. And it would save that location. And we'll say that was where the test happened. That's where the test summary document should be. Um, but let's say this code is universally applicable. So for this code, I'm going to use these shortcuts right underneath the map to say, you know what, this code is applicable to the entire world. It's universally applicable. Save that. All right, I've got everything in. Let's see if there's anything left to do. I'm going to hit the submit link. And no, I'm all done. Success. My submission is saved. You can see here the progress has been updated. It's now in curation. And uh, if I want to check on the status of my submission, I can come back and view it there uh, on the home page or under my submissions at any time and see uh, its status and, uh, and get the link to it. Um, once you hit that first save, it's generated a nice permanent URI or a permanent link to your data set. So if you wanted to include a link to your data in an upcoming publication, I could take this link right here or even just copy it from right here, copy location and uh, paste that into my paper. And that would be the, the final link to the data set. Um, great question from Quay in chat. And that is, what if a data sets moratorium is event based, for example, uh, associated with a publication? Should we guess a date? Absolutely. Um, if you want to, uh, if you want to restrict the release of your data to coincide with the publication date, even right now, even though I've already submitted and that's in curation, I can come back in here and check that moratorium and say, you know what? Uh, let's say my conference is going to happen March 15th, but it spans from the 15th to the 19th, and I don't necessarily know when my talk is going to be. Um, why don't I just go ahead and select? March 2021, um, I'll select the last day, the 19th, and save that. And now it's under moratorium and curation can proceed as, as applicable. And then when I actually figure out when that publication date is, I can come back in here and adjust it. And as long as it's not in the past, um, I can adjust it and it will just automatically be released on that future date. Now, the, the one catch is uh, because of the provenance strategy, your submission's only editable during these phases. Once it's been curated and it goes into that time release vault, you can't make changes to it anymore. So if we get all the way through curation uh, and you want to change that moratorium date, just shoot us an email and one of our curators will change it for you. And that's just because at that point, um, the metadata started propagating out to all of those partnering sites. And so when we do change that date, we have to push that change to all the different partnering sites. So it gets a little trickier on our end, but we're happy to accommodate that. Great question. And that's actually it. I know we only got a couple of minutes left, but that's the end of the data submission training. Any other questions? Feel free to post questions in chat or um, just unmute yourself and ask away. All right, I know that was a lot of information. I have a very quick question, uh, John. So, yep. so when it comes to submission of all of this data, is there like a contact person that we can work with if we have any questions or issues related to our submissions just to make sure we get it right? Is it like, 
Yeah, a support person, or is that you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, let me just pull that up again. So first of all, um, uh, I'll show you a couple other things real quick, and I'm glad you asked that. Um, you can always hit contact Water Dams Health. Um, it's just going to open an email right to us, and we'll get that. Um, that goes to the whole Water Dams team. The Water Dams team um, is right here, as I mentioned. Uh, myself will be on that list, along with Katie Broderson, our data curation lead, our lead developer, and Jay Huggins, our data mig migration expert. And then if we need to uh, expand beyond that to bring in Quay or any of the other super valuable Nawe team members, we can. Um, but uh, a quick email to that Water Dams help hits all four of us up on a distribution list, and we'll definitely take care of whatever questions you have. There we go. Okay. And the other thing I want to show is that while submitting data, um, you also have this tutorial. If you want additional information and examples of different fields, you can go through and click this tutorial and I'll sort of walk you through exactly what I mentioned during the training. This training session will be posted online somewhere in video form and there's also an FAQ, although. I know how much people love FAQs, but uh, most of the information we covered in the training also shows up here. So if you have any um, support type issues, like how do you create a zip file or um, how do you link to an, another site and examples of good links and bad links and what to be on the lookout for, et cetera, um, there's some, some useful information here as well. Great question. And with that, we're out of time. Um, I have a few minutes, so if anyone wants to ask any last minute questions, uh, please feel free to go ahead. Otherwise, I'll be posting this video and uh, I encourage you to go to Water Dams, check it out. If you have any questions that I didn't get to, I apologize. Feel free to put them in email form and I'll happily get back to you. All right, well, thank you everyone for your time and your patience. I appreciate it and hopefully you found this informative.